Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. This is uh, Cash Compeller, your host for today. I'm a research director with the Real Story Group and uh, our topic for today is uh, the right way to select marketing automation in social technology. So moving to the next slide. So I just want to set a bit of uh, context here. So the usual way we do these webinars is uh, we sort of jump into how you can uh, select a technology, a specific uh, piece of software that you're interested in. But when you actually step back and think about it, you're selecting this technology to pursue an enterprise strategy for certain specific objectives and goals. So there are two sides to this, uh, to achieving your objectives. One is obviously having the right tools in place. And the second, the other side of the coin is that being able to exploit or leverage, effectively leverage the tools that you have purchased or are looking to purchase. So even if you don't take anything else out of this webinar, I hope you keep this uh, framework in mind, which I'm calling the mind the gap model of uh, technology selection. So what it essentially is saying is that, uh, I mean, obviously this marketing technology marketplace is very rapidly evolving. So that, that's a good news for digital marketers because uh, you now have uh, new opportunities and to be able to do things that you were probably not able to do earlier. That's a good news. But uh, in our experience of working with so many customers and so many enterprises across the globe, we increasingly ha get this sense that the tools are way ahead of uh, many organizations' ability to leverage these tools effectively. So, I mean, this is interesting because you not only, in such a scenario, you not only want to assess what the tools can really do, but also what you can do with them. So that that's... Uh, that's a key question. So obviously there are two gaps that I'm calling out here. One I'm calling the capacity gap, which is uh, the difference between what the tools can really do versus what you can do with them. And then there is the hyperbole gap, which is what the vendor says their software can do and uh, what the software can really do. So the right side of the equation, the hyperbole gap, that's more easily solved than the capacity gap. I mean, in fact, Real Story Group has solved that uh, hyperbole gap for you through our research, through our advisory services, etc. But I, I want to sort of approach this uh, question of how do we select the right technology or what's the right way to select this technology through the lenses of both these gaps. So vendors, obviously, I mean, they sugarcoat a bit in terms of their platform capabilities. Probably they, they sort of underplay the level of customization that is required or they present uh, work in progress integration efforts as having already been achieved. There is nothing new in this. I mean, that, that presenting a rosy picture is their job and a bit of diligence on your part can uncover that. And this gap is easily bridged. But the second gap is uh, the onus is really on the enterprises or the customers. So here, when I say a capacity gap, I, I use the term very broadly. This could refer to several different things, like the breadth and the depth the expertise levels of your current digital marketing teams. It could refer to the technical infrastructure such as CRM that you have for storing all your customer data. Or it could refer to the content that you can offer. If you, if you want to do personalization or segmentation, do you have enough content to be able to serve all of those segments that you're targeting? So it could refer to different things. So essentially the risk of this capacity gap is that uh, you may not be able to tap the existing capacities, existing capabilities of your tools. So that, that, that's the implication for this. So moving to the next slide. So it's interesting to think about uh, why these uh, gaps arise. I mean, it's uh, even the best of enterprises can find themselves in a quandary because uh, the shifts can happen faster than your ability to react to them, your ability or your vendor's ability to do course corrections, some things, uh, I mean, you just uh, catch you sort of by surprise. So an example that we can all relate to is perhaps the rise and rise of uh, the smartphones or the mobile phones in the enterprise. So moving to the next slide, I am sure uh, 
many of you are familiar with this example of uh, the migration of the wild wildebeest uh, in Africa. So, so you, you mean the mobile migration, the migration of uh, consumers is happening in such droves. But, but I mean, if we pause and uh, think back, actually this migration is not happening. But my contention is that uh, it has already happened, uh, as we'll see in the next uh, slide. So I, I will present uh, some data for you. So this is uh, from uh, Ben Evans, who, who's uh, published a lot of uh, ideas and information under the moniker of the mobile is uh, eating the world. So here what you see, that uh, orange bar is the time that uh, consumers are spending in mobile apps, while the dark gray at the bottom is the time that is uh, spent on desktop uh, or laptop devices. So as you can see here, in June 2013 itself, that's like nearly two years ago, consumers were probably spending equal amount of time. But when you look at a year later to June 2014, you'll see that uh, more time is spent in mobile apps than on the web. So, and imagine, I mean, that's, that's why I said the migration has already happened. This is uh, last year's uh, data. So if you look at it, this year's data, it, it's, I'm, I'm sure the gap is widened uh, even more. So if we move to the next slide, while uh, the last slide has presented uh, the mobile versus a desktop picture, this slide taken from uh, the latest Internet Trends uh, report that Mary Meeker of uh, the venture capital firm KPCB has put together. This considers a lot more uh, media, not just uh, the mobile and desktop devices, but uh, it, it sort of considers uh, and also a much uh, longer uh, time frame. Here, uh, the dark blue bars that you see is the time that is uh, spent on desktop or laptop devices, while the green bars at the top are the time spent uh, by consumers uh, on mobile devices. This is why they're, they're consuming different forms of content on these uh, devices. So this this gives you the number of hours per day that consumers are spending on these uh, things. So you'll see that in 2013 itself, consumers were spending an equal amount of time in desktops and laptops. And the amount of time that consumers are spending on mobile devices has been only going up since then, while uh, the desktop time has more or less uh, so in 2015, uh, for the first five months of this year, more than half the time is being spent on mobile devices while uh, desktop is only about 42%. So this should uh, tell us uh, something. So if we move to the next uh, slide. So we tend to think of uh, you want to be where uh, the puck is or not where the puck is, but where the puck is going. So, so here, uh, but data bears out that uh, enterprises are not even going where the puck is, but are where the puck was a couple of years ago. So only 3% of marketing budgets are spent on mobile devices. And shockingly, only 50% of uh, the mobile, uh, of the websites of large brands are mobile friendly. And only 8% of ad budget is spent on mobile. We will look at uh, each of these things in uh, turn in the next uh, slide. So if we move to the next slide, you'll see that, uh, so this, uh, I'm presenting data from uh, two sources here. I mean, you keep hearing, uh, as a small aside, you keep hearing that uh, marketing is uh, being increasingly data-driven. So I thought, why not make this webinar also a lot more data-driven? So that's why you see a lot of uh, data in the first section of this uh, presentation. So yeah, coming back to this slide itself. So the CMO survey is a fairly influential and uh, good survey. If you haven't uh, taken a look at it, please do take a look at it. And it's conducted by the Duke University in alongside uh, McKinsey and the American Marketing Association. So it shows that only 2% of, uh, sorry, 3.2% of uh, the marketing budget is spent on mobile activities. So the next thing in the right side, the pie chart that you see is from TechCrunch where they're just assessing uh, how friendly your website is from a smartphone. So they're not testing whether you're leveraging uh, all the things that are possible using a cell phone, but they're just 
testing uh, whether it loads fast, does it have responsive design or not. And uh, very shockingly, a lot of the big brands uh, fail this test. By the way, I forgot to mention that uh, the CMO survey references wherever you see them, that refers to the Fortune 1000 kind of uh, companies. So, so that to give you a sense of uh, which peer group this is talking about, while the TechCrunch is uh, talking about the Fortune 500. So if we move to the next uh, slide. So essentially the message that clearly comes out is that marketers are la lagging consumers in their embrace of mobile. So let me sort of explain this graph. So the gray bars represent uh, the time that consumers are spending on different media, while the purple bars represent the time, represent the spending on advertisements. So if you think about it uh, over the long term, you would expect that uh, marketers want to catch customers uh, where they are. So both these numbers should be equal. And you see that reflected in uh, the medium, radio, TV, and internet more or less. But you'll see a big disparity when it comes to print and mobile. I mean, I'm not as much worried about print, but if you look at mobile, there, there is a, a big gap. 24% of consumer time is spent on mobile devices, consuming media through mobile devices, but only marketers are reaching them 8% of the time. I mean, broadly, if you use ad spend as a, a proxy. So if we move to the next slide, so uh, here is uh, what's happening. And to summarize, external shifts can happen faster than your ability to adjust course. I mentioned this before. So in the case of mobile, we see this clearly happening. Both the enterprises and the vendors are still running. Obviously, I mean, it, it's okay. I mean, we were all learning. So what I want to leave here is that, uh, I mean, this is, mobile is not the scope of this thing, but it's such a big piece of marketing that I had to mention it. But in case you're interested, you can consult our uh, mobile technology research on how to craft superior mobile experiences and strategies. I would particularly, I mean, encourage our subscribers to take a look, take a look at a webinar that we did on uh, how to build an enterprise mobile technology center of excellence to help drive your mobile strategy. But the more significant or the more serious challenge, or I think a shortcoming I would say is that uh, you've already purchased certain marketing technologies, but resource constraints may be preventing you from exploiting uh, already purchased uh, technologies. So I'll illustrate that in the next couple of slides. So moving to the next slide, I mean, analytics is very hot, right? I mean. So, and, and, and it's uh, sort of some of the big data tools and technologies may be r relatively new, but uh, the traditional marketing analytics uh, technology is uh, fairly mature. And the spend on it reflects that. You saw that mobile spend was only 3.2%, but this spend on marketing analytics is about uh, twice that at 6.4%. So there is no problem with uh, resource constraint in terms of spend. And this is also expected to go. But when you look at what customers are doing or able to achieve with this level of spend, that, that I illustrate in the next slide. In the message that uh, comes out is that uh, very few enterprises are able to fully exploit analytics. So there is a broad range of marketing objectives and a broad range of functions that you hope your technology is going to support be it customer acquisition or uh, lead generation, customer loyalty, social media analytics, which we will talk about in greater detail going forward, your product mix optimization or supporting your branding objectives, pricing strategy. You can see all of that stuff. So none of these exceeds, uh, I mean, a third, only a third of the organizations are saying that they're able to, they're even using, not effectively using, but uh, using marketing analytics. This despite a large spend. So what gives? So I sort of speculate uh, in the next slide in some of these, uh, what are some of the causes? So essentially, the availability and uh, the quality of marketing technologists can be a problem. I mean, you see that uh, reflected. You, you see how there is a shortage of data science people or statisticians you see that uh, reflected. So people who are able to understand both the big picture as well as the use data to drive actionable insights, that, that seems to be in short supply. In, in house, I'm speaking broadly in terms of uh, access to these skills for marketers. So what are the implications from a technology selection point of view? 
I think you should uh, include uh, your total cost of ownership should include any external consulting costs or any professional services costs that you take from agencies or vendor professional services firms or specialized uh, systems integrators. Because, I mean, you've already purchased the tools, but you're not able to leverage them effectively. So this is like all the things that we talked about so far are from the enterprise uh, perspective. Now we sort of are broadly going into the, the hyperbole gap or the vendor side gaps. Sometimes you'll find that the some of the challenges come because of the complexity and the unwieldiness of the tools and the technologies uh, themselves. So if you go to the next slide, so I will uh, very quickly go through this uh, slide. I mean, it's uh, a deep enough topic in itself. This slide is called uh, the marketing the RS RSG's marketing services uh, reference model. It gives you a broad view of enterprise data. I mean, obviously there are different systems. On the left side, you see all the enterprise uh, repositories, which are key to any effective marketing. These contain product data, customer data, personalization data, segmentation data, etc. The systems in the middle, which you see under content and engagement management, these take the data, these process the data from these enterprise repositories, unify them, and sort of present to them based on customer preferences. There are also, I mean, several supplemental technologies which you see in the other layers category. This could be content delivery or e-commerce or communities or portals. To this sort of help you take that data or content through different customer uh, touch points, which you see on the far right. So these are the actual customer channels or the touch points. I mean, broadly the story is that there are a lot of systems, a lot of connections, lots of data, lots of complexity. And you can see how this is uh, manifested for customers in the next slide. So the same survey that I referred to earlier, it asked uh, how effectively are you able to integrate all the data across different channels, across uh, purchasing, across communication, and across social media. So they say the answer is middling. On a scale of 1 to 7, you'll see 3.7 is the typical response. So the story that's coming out here, I mean, obviously you've heard probably many vendors say that they support uh, multi-channel customer engagement. Yes, the tools may be able to support that, but uh, Customers or enterprises are really struggling to unify that data to make meaning out of all the data from the different channels. So this is like a reality check for the, the capacity gap. So if you move to the next reality check, so another, when you think about the online world, another hot topic these days is like behavioral targeting. There is a lot of online data, customer data that is being generated and captured. But when uh, you ask, I mean, this is asked after accounting for privacy concerns and data security concerns, etc. Whether uh, all this data that is being collected online is it being used for targeting and personalization? Less than uh, half, 42% say that uh, they are able to use it. The majority is not able to use it, and this is because, I, I mean, marketing is uh, data driven, but that data is in silos. So enterprises are really struggling to make sense of the data that is being generated and being held in uh, different uh, sources and systems. So that leads us uh, to the next thing, so, which shows that, uh, I mean, this is a report that we put out uh, in the first quarter of this year, which shows that a fully integrated marketing platform is mythical, just like the Himalayan Yeti. And all of you know that the Himalayan snowman is mythical, but still, the public is fascinated with that. Every now and then, I mean, excited mountain climbers come back and say they've seen the Yeti or the snowman. Our contention is that the fully integrated marketing clouds are as elusive. Because if you think about it, practically all the current marketing clouds have been put together from uh, different uh, systems because these systems have been acquired by the larger vendors over time. So integrated is like, more a wish list than current reality. So what's the practical implementation of this thing? I mean, be prepared to do some of the heavy lifting uh, yourselves. So what does that mean? I mean, if, if you move to the next slide, essentially the truth is that uh, there is really no single uh, 
technology that can do it all for you when it comes to marketers. So essentially, at least for some time to come, for the next two, three years, you're playing a best of uh, breed game. Whether you're playing it or whether the vendor is playing it by integrating all the tools that are required, it's a best of breed game. So you have to tweak the tools uh, to your requirements. And uh, I mean, you, But the good thing is that there is a wide variety of uh, tools at your disposal. We'll focus on a couple of them today, which is marketing automation and uh, social media marketing. So we're, we're running a little behind time, so I'll speed up uh, from, from, from this point in time. So if you move to the next slide, what, what we've done is uh, we sort of uh, presented our take on the marketing and uh, customer experience management uh, tools. We'll talk about the first top two buckets there, marketing automation and uh, social media. This is only a partial list. So essentially the state of the market is uh, such that uh, we, we divide these into platforms, products, and uh, maybe tools or uh, social media marketing. These tend to be lighter uh, weight tools, so we don't uh, break them out further apart. So essentially, there are uh, we would say there are about uh, six to eight uh, serious platforms. Platforms meaning end to end, which at least on paper claim to be able to do everything. There are about maybe a, a dozen, uh, depending a dozen or more, depending on uh, the kind of scale you're talking about are interested in dozen products and probably a two dozen uh, other serious uh, contenders in the social media space. So that, that's about the real estate that we're talking about. Uh, I mean, you'll see a whole lot of uh, landscapes and graphics which we sort of present like hundreds and hundreds of uh, marketing technology vendors, but, but that would be broad, too broadly defining uh, many adjacent and supporting technologies. So essentially, you're probably dealing about maybe 30, 35, three dozen vendors at most when we're talking about marketing automation and social media functionality, social media marketing functionality. So if we move to the next slide, I'll take a very brief stab at uh, sort of uh, explaining what marketing automation and social media marketing tools do. Essentially, marketing automation helps you build and enrich and promote leads, run different campaigns across uh, channels. In a B2B context, uh, this would lead to lead qualification and lead nurturing before you can hand off to a, a Salesforce automation or a customer relationship uh, management tool. In a B2C context, uh, it, the hope is that it would help you generate more personalized offers or segmentation and do some uh, nifty analysis to identify patterns which you haven't done before. In the context of uh, social media, marketing, they provide, uh, I mean, this, this segment is uh, relatively new. They essentially help you monitor the social web and do different actions based on that. When I say they monitor the social web, you're talking broadly about Facebook, Twitter, and blogging platforms and several other things. So you can monitor your, your brand, con conversations around your brand there. You can probably do some deep dives into the emerging trends and themes. You can identify who, who's well connected on these networks, who's driving the word of mouth or generating some buzz. And you can also interact with uh, such uh, individuals. So essentially, broadly taken, what uh, marketing automation and social media marketing tools help you do is you meet the customers where they are and in a channel of their uh, choice. So that's the promise of these uh, tools. And since this we're a bit out of time, I'm just going to move into the next section, which is uh, the selection approach and uh, process. So we move to slide uh, 24, the next slide. So our take on uh, technology selection has broadly, this summarizes it, I mean, it's all about fit. We've always held in the last uh, 13, 14 years of uh, being around that uh, it's not about a single best friend, uh, but it's all about fit. So what does that uh, really mean? So we hold that each product is really good at doing something well. Though they may claim that they support uh, several scenarios or use cases, but it's really geared to do a few or a single scenario in some cases uh, very well. So we hold that uh, this scenarios or use cases should drive your selection. You, you're hoping to see what are the scenarios that you're most interested in and find the vendor that does uh, that very well. So that should leave your, uh, lead your selection approach. But there are other fits also that you should look at, which is uh, technology fit which broadly refers to integration with your existing uh, enterprise systems. What are the out-of-box integrations that they provide? What kind of APIs are there, etc. 
and uh, in a partner fit you're assessing the softer aspects if you will does the vendor work well with you I mean, do you sense that they work well with you do they seem like responsive enough to your requirements what kind of customer support options are they providing? What kind of training options? What kind of geographical reach do they provide? What kind of SLAs do they support, etc.? And the last one, value fit, refers to the economics of it, the cost calculus, if you will. What's the cost versus uh, value? So you would explore what's the total cost of ownership? What's the licensing model behind a particular product, etc.? So that, that's what you would explore in that value. So in the next few slides, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm sort of going to offer you certain uh, frameworks or examples of how this has been done by several customers and how our research maps to that. As I mentioned, whether explicitly stated or not, different products, uh, they, they target, they go after different use cases. So you, you want to see what are the relative strengths and weaknesses of a particular vendor or tool for your particular circumstances. So when it comes to these two categories of software, marketing automation and social media marketing, we've sort of abstracted these into seven scenarios, social media monitoring, social media intelligence, campaigns, social media customer support and engagement. And B2C lead offer, lead and offer management, B2B lead management and nurturing, and mobile marketing. So please note that uh, we call out mobile separately as a scenario in its own right, because some customers are just focus on improving that. But mobile actually cuts across all of these other uh, scenarios as well. So, so you'd want to evaluate uh, it not only separately if that's of interest to you, but also what are the mobile capabilities and broadly cross-channel capabilities supported across uh, these uh, scenarios. So moving to the next slide. So this uh, illustrates uh, what I mean by the scenario fits. We take two vendors. So we're updating our research so, so the ratings that you see are really probably not up to date or whatever, but they're only for illustration purposes. So a circle is sort of zero or this, while a fully blackened Harvey ball is a four. So you'd want your vendor to score high on a scenario you're interested in. So Silverpop has been acquired by IBM, so it's IBM Silverpop now, while Salesforce uh, has acquired exact target. So if you look at uh, the ratings itself, you'll see that one vendor is good at B2C offer management, while the other uh, is not very good at B2C offer management, but can uh, offer you decent B2B and uh, social customer support. So now if you're a customer, uh, obviously your choice is going to be dependent on, there is no best vendor here as such, but uh, it depends really on which scenario you're interested uh, in. So moving to the next fit, which is the technology fit in our uh, four-piece uh, framework. Here we were talking about uh, integration, that, that that's very key. Security, yes. And then uh, scalability, because uh, in B2C scenarios and even in B2B scenarios, and in uh, social media, you're talking not about hundreds of thousands, but probably millions of uh, records. So what you're seeing here is an illustration, an extract from our uh, valuations. So visible technologies uh, is now part of uh, the PR technology firm, Cision and Vocus. While Sysimos uh, till recently was part of a company called MarketWire, but now it's independent again. So they again differ on uh, integration versus uh, several other factors. So if you're interested in uh, using it standalone, perhaps uh, you wouldn't, uh, I mean, mind some, some, some vendor which scores less on the integration aspects. But if you want to work it well with your existing tech stack, that probably has a higher weightage. Similarly for uh, scalability, so this is a way of uh, surfacing uh, different uh, differences or the differences between uh, different vendors. So now if I move to the next uh, slide. So this is a, a tricky aspect which is the vendor intangibles. So obviously these are uh, very important and it's probably a little difficult to quantify, but uh, if you talk to enough customers, either directly or through proxies such as RSG, I mean, that, that, that's something that we do, which is like aggregate uh, really, I mean, dozens and hundreds of customer conversations into a rating to see, do they work well with small customers? Do they work well with customers in a particular uh, 
region because they have geographic reach or they don't have geographic reach? Do they work well with, uh, I mean, only large enterprises, etc.? So you, you'd, you'd want to evaluate uh, those criterion. I mean, what you're seeing is an illustration of Marketo done some time uh, back. So we evaluate across these different aspects to arrive at, I mean, a more easily graspable rating while at the same time assessing that this is not like a, a checklist approach but more something that is geared to your own context and use cases. So another interesting uh, aspect of the partner fit is in the next slide. So every year we publish what is known as a, a market analysis or a reality check for each of the segments uh, that we cover where we broadly plot uh, the extent of change in a particular product as well as how fast a vendor's organization itself is uh, changing. So we, we call it, this is the marketing automation and social techno technology reality check published during the first quarter of this year. So I, first of all, I want to clarify that there is no leader or a, a magic spot or a magic patch in this garden. So di different vendors uh, move at different paces and that has to match with the kind of uh, support of the kind of uh, your own internal dynamics as well. So if you're a buyer, enterprise buyer with like very strong internal capabilities, for instance, or if you're an early adopter, you may want to go with uh, a product that is undergoing a rapid change so that you can leapfrog your own competition. But some other uh, enterprises may prefer uh, a vendor or a product who's changing at a moderate pace. Well, some others may absolutely say we want somebody who's conservative, I mean, because for whatever reasons. So the, the model of the story is that uh, each buyer will rate the importance of these factors uh, very differently based on their own uh, unique circumstances. But, but again, this is an interesting analysis to do in your own case. Because what we find is that uh, larger vendors typically tend to bring in a lot more uh, stability, slow, slow and steady, while innovation in the marketplace is uh, typically coming in from uh, the smaller and the more uh, nimble vendors. So, that's, so what is important for you in a particular context will drive that. For instance, in a social media marketing management, uh, case, depending on your industry, if you're in a financial, heavily regulated industry such as a financial services industry, even though you'd like, uh, they say, the fast pace of change, a fast moving vendor, you'll also want to pay attention to whether they comply, they allow you to comply with all your regulatory requirements. But if you're probably in another industry which is not as heavily regulated, you may choose innovation over uh, that, that kind of a regulatory features that they bring in. So that, that, that's uh, I mean, the takeaway from this slide. So moving to the next slide. So I don't have a specific slide on the value fit itself. I mean, it's broadly, I mean, you want to include all elements of the total cost of ownership to see how much it's really going to cost. We talked about the capacity gaps, both at the vendor side as well as on the enterprise side. So you want to see if you have capacity gaps in a particular area, so you want to include that in your total cost of ownership. Examine the fine print of the licensing model as well. We don't have time to go into the details of that, but that, that's what would fit into the value spectrum. I mean, I thought I'll leave with a, a selection funnel because marketing funnel, though the shape of that is changing and we're no longer sure what's the shape of the marketing funnel given the drastic change in how the customer journeys are panning out. But it essentially you start off with a longish shortlist with maybe 10 vendors and you shortlist that to six to say who, who's going to receive your RFP. Then you schedule demos with uh, maybe half of them and finally have a bake-off or do a proof of concept with one or two of them before you finally down select one. So this is different from a, a regular uh, RFP based uh, thing because uh, you're not testing based on features, there is no checklist approach here, but you're testing via the scenarios in the RFP. So you're uh, again then testing not can demos but uh, custom demos that have to work in your own uh, environment and using your own uh, data. And then again you, you're going to, in the last step, want to use the pilots that uh, are relevant to you using the criterion that you specify. So this process may take slightly longer and probably is, uh, it, it would appear uh, in the short term to cost a bit more. 
but but I mean it sort of makes sure that you don't end up with the tool that you can't uh, really use or the tool that is not uh, best fit in, our, in your scenario. So in the long term it would uh, pay for itself. And we have seen this approach uh, successfully being uh, deployed at uh, several customer instances. So this has been our uh, sort of se favorite selection mantra or process for different customer segments, not just for uh, marketing uh, technology, but other things as well. Now on to the last slide. We've sort of overrun by about uh, 10 minutes here. So that, that's our uh, report, the marketing automation and social evaluation uh, report. It's uh, a free sample from that is uh, available uh, from our uh, website. So thank you all.